So my question, are we alone? The story of humans is the story of ideas. Scientific ideas that shine light into dark corners. Ideas that we embrace rationally and irrationally. Ideas for which we've lived and died and killed and been killed. Ideas that have vanished in history and ideas that have been set in dogma. It's a story of nations, of ideologies, of territories, and of conflicts among them. But every moment of human history, from the Stone Age to the Information Age, from Sumer and Babylon to the iPod and celebrity gossip, They've all been carried out. Every book that you've read, every poem, every laugh, every tear, they've all happened here. 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 <laughs> Perspective is a very powerful thing. Perspectives can change. Perspectives can be altered. From my perspective, we live on a fragile island of life in a universe of possibilities. For many millennia, humans have been on a journey to find answers, answers to questions about naturalism and transcendence about who we are and why we are and, of course, who else might be out there. Is it really just us? Are we alone in this vast universe of energy and matter and chemistry and physics? Well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space. <laughs> but what if we're not? What if out there others are asking and answering similar questions? What if they look up at the night sky at the, at the same stars but from the opposite side? Would the discovery of an older cultural civilization out there inspire us to find ways to survive our increasingly uncertain technological adolescence. Might it be the discovery of a distant civilization and our common cosmic origins that finally drives home the message of the bond among all humans? Whether we're born in San Francisco or Sudan or close to the heart of the Milky Way galaxy, we are the products of a billion-year lineage of wandering stardust. We, all of us, are what happens when a primordial mixture of hydrogen and helium evolves for so long that it begins to ask where it came from. Fifty years ago, the journey to find answers took a different path, and SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, began. So what exactly is SETI? Well, SETI uses the tools of astronomy to try and find evidence of someone else's technology out there. Our own technologies are visible over interstellar distances, and theirs might be as well. It might be that some massive network of communications or some shield against asteroidal impact or some huge astroengineering project that we can't even begin to conceive of could generate signals at radio or optical frequencies that a determined program of searching might detect. For millennia, we've actually turned to the priests and the philosophers for guidance and instruction on this question of whether there's intelligent life out there. Now we can use the tools of the 21st century 
to try and observe what is rather than ask what should be believed. SETI doesn't presume the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence. It merely notes the possibility, if not the probability, in this vast universe, which seems fairly uniform. The numbers suggest a universe of possibilities. Our sun is one of 400 billion stars in our galaxy, and we know that many other stars have planetary systems. We've discovered over 350 in the last 14 years, including um, the uh, small planet announced earlier this week, which has a radius just twice the size of the Earth. And if even all of the planetary systems in our galaxy were devoid of life, there's still 100 billion other galaxies out there, altogether 10 to the 22 stars. Now I'm going to try a trick and recreate an experiment from this morning. Remember, one billion, but this time not one billion dollars, one billion stars, all right? One billion stars. Now up there, 20 feet above the stage, that's 10 trillion. Well, what about 10 to the 22? Where's the line that marks that? That line would have to be 3.8 million miles above this stage. <laughs> 16 times farther away than the moon or 4% of the distance to the sun. So there are many possibilities. <laughs> and much of this vast universe, much more may be habitable than we once thought as we study extremophiles on Earth, organisms that can live in conditions totally inhospitable for us in the, the hot, high-pressure thermal vents at the bottom of the ocean, frozen in ice, in boiling battery acid, in the cooling waters of nuclear reactors. These extremophiles tell us that life may exist in many other environments. But those environments are going to be widely spaced in this universe. Even our nearest star, the sun, its emissions suffer the tyranny of light speed. It takes a full eight minutes for its radiation to reach us. And the nearest star is 4.2 light years away, which means its light takes 4.2 years to get here. And the edge of our galaxy is 75,000 light years away. And the nearest galaxy to us, 2.5 million light years. That means any signal that we detect would have started its journey a long time ago. And a signal will give us a glimpse of their past, not their present, which is why Phil Morrison calls SETI the archaeology of the future. It tells us about their past, but detection of a signal tells us it's possible for us to have a long future. I think this is what David Deutsch meant in 2005 when he ended his Oxford TED Talk by saying he had two principles he'd like to share for living and he would like to carve them on stone tablets. The first is that problems are inevitable. The second is that problems are soluble. So ultimately what's going to determine the success or failure of SETI is the longevity of technologies. And the mean distance between technologies in the cosmos, distance over space and distance over time. If technologies don't last and persist, we will not succeed. And we're a very young technology in an old galaxy, and we don't yet know whether it's possible for technologies to persist. So up until now, I've been talking to you about really large numbers. Let me talk about a relatively small number. And that's the length of time that the Earth was lifeless. If we look at zircons that are mined in the Jack Hills of Western Australia, zircons taken from the Jack Hills of Western Australia tell us that within a few hundred million years of the origin of the planet, there was abundant water and perhaps even life. So our planet has spent the vast majority of its 4.56 billion year history developing life, 
not anticipating its emergence. Life happened very quickly, and that bodes well for the potential of life elsewhere in the cosmos. And the other thing that one should take away from this chart is the very narrow range of time over which humans can claim to be the dominant intelligence on the planet. It's only the last few hundred thousand years that modern humans have been pursuing technology and civilization. So one needs a very deep appreciation of the diversity and incredible scale of life on this planet as the first step in preparing to make contact with life elsewhere in the cosmos.